History's Little Ice Age, Big Chill. The temperature plummeted. Birds are falling dead out of the sky because it is that cold. Freezing storms were everywhere. Snow fell in July. The earth was gripped in an ice age. It was just a disastrous situation. But it wasn't the period when woolly mammoths roamed the earth 15,000 years ago. It was a different era of cataclysmic cold, one that began just 700 years ago. A period known as the Little Ice Age. Some of these men actually froze to death in early September. Most unusual occurrence. From the 14th to the 19th century, the Little Ice Age hit man. Millions perished as the cold triggered a deadly chain reaction across civilization. The suffering was totally harrowing. It seems as if the weather itself was conspiring to crush them. Could it happen again? Some of my colleagues think that we could go into an abrupt cooling state in a matter of decades. What chaos would a new ice age trigger? It's not at all implausible that these are the conditions under which nuclear weapons might be used. Is the past a window to our future? What is the cold, hard truth of history's most recent big chill? In the summer of 1653, high in the French Alps, a monster crept towards the defenseless village of Natasse. The townspeople believed the forces of evil had unleashed it, and only God could save them. A contingent of priests armed only with holy water set off to confront the monster face to face. Finally, the priests came to a halt. Before them towered the object of the villagers' fears, a titanic river of ice. The glacier was one of many in the Alps that were swiftly advancing further than they had in thousands of years. The Alpine peasants were being surrounded by the encroaching ice, which was engulfing their villages and farmlands. They believed there was only one explanation. The glaciers had been possessed by the devil. Indre, yete ono, mukam, ora tem bebikats, Sprinkling their holy water, the priests performed the rite of exorcism. With God's help, they hoped to stop the glacier's devastating advance. If the clergyman failed, no power on earth would be able to save the Alpine peasants from disaster. No one that freezing day had any inkling that the glaciers threatening them were just one piece of a climatic puzzle that lasted from the 14th to the 19th century, an era now known as the Little Ice Age. Its effects were less dramatic than the last major ice age, which ended about 10,000 years ago, when 30% of the Earth was covered in ice but its impact in many parts of the world was nevertheless devastating. 
a little ice age cooling was as much as uh, minus two to minus three degrees centigrade less than the average temperature of today. That may not seem like much, but it's something that if we had uh, experience with it in the modern world, it would really be a big disruption to our lives. It was a period, however, much more of extreme volatility of climate than of constant cold. The Little Ice Age was a period of very volatile climatic shifts, mixed up without any logic or cycle to them. You couldn't predict them. It was a modest change compared to the things we see in the geological record. But we know from historical accounts that it, it didn't take much to disrupt society. The Little Ice Age reshaped the world in ways that now seem the stuff of fantasy. New York Harbor froze for five weeks, allowing people to walk from Manhattan to Staten Island. Eskimos sailed their kayaks as far south as Scotland. And two feet of snow fell on New England in June and July, during a season so cold it was remembered in both America and Europe as the year without a summer. The cooler climate played havoc and changed the course of history. From a freezing summer storm that decimated the Spanish Armada, to the famines that drove France's masses into Paris, demanding affordable bread, fueling the uprising that led to the French Revolution. If a recent theory is true, the Little Ice Age helped produce the exquisite tone of the Stradivarius violin. And explains why Americans today drink 11 times more beer than wine. The natural forces that caused the Little Ice Age are a mystery. Climatologists are determined to unravel it. They believe it was not an isolated event, but part of a recurring cycle. And that the Little Ice Age may be a chilling blueprint of our future. The reason why it's important to study the Little Ice Age is because it gives us an idea of how large climate fluctuations are really possible. In other words, what nature really has in store for us. If you have some idea of how large climate variations have been in the past, it gives you an idea of what's possible for the future. For all our technological power, we can't control the climate. And the Little Ice Age gives us a fascinating perspective on the myth that the climate is unchanging. It's not, and we ignore its changes to our peril. For decades, these scientists have been attempting to accurately reconstruct the climate of the Little Ice Age. Their progress has been limited because reliable instrumental data, like temperature and rainfall measurement, date back no more than two centuries. But over the ages, the Earth itself has preserved valuable clues to its climate history, a natural record from which scientists are now gaining a remarkable insight. One of the richest archives lies miles beneath the surface of the world's oceans. Scientists have drilled thousands of cores from the layers of sediment on the sea floor. Every two to four inches represents a thousand years of accumulation. Encased in the cores are the fossilized remains of microscopic creatures that have helped scientists determine global temperatures during the Little Ice Age. There are maybe 26 species of these organisms that we know that exist in the whole ocean. So in one core, we might have all 26 species, but there will be different abundances of those 26 species. Now we know that some like to live in cold areas and some like to live in warm areas, so you can think of them as being there are warm lovers and there are cold lovers. It turns out that the ratio of warm lovers to cold lovers is actually directly related to temperature. So all we need to do is count the relative percentage of warm lovers to cold lovers and we can bang get a temperature. 
These sediment cores indicate that the Little Ice Age averaged four degrees Fahrenheit cooler than today. On the surface, that shift seems negligible. But climatologists have learned that human populations are alarmingly vulnerable to even the smallest drop in temperature. The Little Ice Age descended with devastating suddenness around the year 1300, on a warm world whose climate was not unlike our own. In Europe, society had reordered itself after the fall of the Roman Empire and the tumultuous Dark Ages. It was a period when most people scraped out a hand-to-mouth living from the land controlled by the medieval nobility. An age that witnessed the rise of urban centers, the growth of trade, and the escalating strength of society's most powerful institution, the church. For some 400 years, between 900 and 1300, this world had basked in a climate four to seven degrees warmer than the colder and stagnant Dark Ages. Scientists and historians called the era the medieval warm period, coinciding with one of civilization's greatest surges of prosperity. It is also called the little climate optimum. Over the course of the medieval warming period, there is just a tremendous sense that things are improving, that uh, there's a sense of growth and creativity and vitality in the society. At that period of time, everybody was very dependent upon agriculture. If crops failed, people starved. During the medieval warm period, crops became more reliable. The food production went up. Because the swamps dried up, the mosquitoes disappeared, and malaria went way down. And uh, all of the diseases that they had been suffering from all diminished. Population boomed. During this medieval warm period, Europe's peasants swelled from 40 million to 60 million. Populations also soared in Russia, China, and North America, as agriculture expanded north to regions once too cold for farming. Europe's supreme winemakers, the French, were appalled to see vineyards thriving in a suddenly balmy southern England. The wine produced apparently was so good that it was exported to France, and there were records of French lords complaining that British wine, or English wine, was undercutting their own product, and they made attempts to legislate against it. As the warm climate embraced Europe, its population embarked on an unparalleled building spree. These were the generations that erected Westminster Abbey, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and the magnificent Gothic cathedrals still held in awe today. I think it's pretty clear that this new form of architecture, a one in which your eyes are immediately drawn heavenward as you walk into the structure, is related to a much greater sense of optimism about humankind, about human potentiality, and a, a much greater sense of, uh, of, 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 of kind of optimism about the relationship between God and human society. 13th century notions of prosperity and optimism are different, however, to today's. Even in times of wonderful weather, even in times of prosperity, the medieval farmer, the medieval peasant, lived on the edge of doom. The average age is probably around 35 or 36. The level of infant mortality is appalling. Very few children, probably one in every two, dies before the age of one. So what we are talking about here is a very harsh world. Any change in the weather can be catastrophic. Despite the tenuous nature of their lives, the people of Europe looked towards the future with their continuing sense of hope. On the eve of the Little Ice Age, they made the same assumption many make today. They expected the climate they had known for centuries to continue unchanged. They were soon to learn that they were no match for just a few degrees drop in temperature.
At the dawn of the 14th century, an unseasonable chill began to descend on the warm world of the Middle Ages. With brutal swiftness, over the course of only a decade, the average global temperature dropped to a level some four degrees colder than today. The change was as sinister as it was subtle. The Little Ice Age would expose all of medieval society's vulnerabilities, triggering a devastating chain reaction that spanned 500 years. The idea that the world became globally cooler during the Little Ice Age is, I think, an oversimplification. Uh, it looks like it was very cold, for instance, in Northern Europe, but it was not that the whole world was thrown into some giant chill. In places like Western Europe, it seems that what was uh, happening was it wasn't just that the mean temperature was colder, but there were a lot of significant extremes. And many winters in which the temperatures were severely cold. From Norway to New Zealand, glaciers began their rapid advance, growing more widespread than at any time in the previous 10,000 years. In England, the Thames froze frequently, inspiring a carnival-like tradition called the Frost Fair. Merchants and merrymakers flocked to the ice, setting up food stalls and sideshows. The first was celebrated in 1607, the last in 1814. The Frost Fairs were among the few pleasant byproducts of the sudden shift in climate. More typical was the disaster that descended on Europe in the 14th century, the first catastrophe linked to the Little Ice Age. In 1315, from the Ural Mountains, deep in the heart of what is European Russia today, all the way to Ireland, the weather changed dramatically for the worse. Just as the crops were planted, it started to rain, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained. And many of the crops planted on marginal land were simply washed away due to soil erosion. The drenching rains persisted for five long years. The Little Ice Age was to be an era not only of cooler temperatures, but also of more frequent and intense storms. Throughout Europe, once fertile farmlands became waterlogged mud pits, littered with flattened crops. For the multitudes of peasants whose numbers had soared during the medieval warm period, there was little or nothing to eat. By the end of the first year, there was hunger. By the end of the sixth, over 1.5 million people had died throughout Europe from starvation and from famine-related diseases. Over the course of the Great Famine, crime soared. Grave robbers stole valuables buried with corpses and traded them for anything edible. The desperate assaulted anyone with food. When the crisis ended in the 1320s, the traumatized survivors returned to their harsh work in the drying fields. But they didn't understand that their choice of crops would continue to make them dangerously vulnerable. Peasants grew mostly cereal grains, wheat, barley, oats and rye, with which they made the breads and soups they relied on to live. Cereals were tailor-made for the benign climate of the medieval warm period, but exposed to the elements on long stalks above the ground, they made easy targets for the Little Ice Age. The problem is that the grain is the heavy part of the plant. And so in conditions of, of high winds or in conditions of, of really extreme uh, rainfall, these plants are very vulnerable. They're very susceptible to breaking or to being beaten down, falling into the ground. And then once the, uh, once the, the, the grain has come into contact with the moist soil, um, then it's uh, likely to be unusable after that. Throughout Europe, crop failures persisted sporadically for centuries to come. Famine after famine produced a harvest of death. Between 1371 and 1791, 111 famines devastated France alone. 
In 1601, one famine in Russia was responsible for half a million deaths. In a world in which there is so little food and in which most people are hungry all the time, and if you have a family, it is not uncommon in this period to kill your own children, or at least some of them, in order to reserve food for the rest. The story of Hansel and Gretel is indeed representative, and it's a story that goes back to the memories of the Middle Ages. Parents who don't have enough to eat and who take the children into the woods and abandon them there so as they could have enough food for themselves and for others. People didn't often die of starvation. What they died of were famine-related diseases. And the episodes of malnutrition and other conditions which they acquired during the disaster of 1315 may well have debilitated them somewhat to the point that they were more vulnerable to outbreaks of bubonic plague which swept across Europe in medieval times. The bubonic plague arrived in Europe in 1347, carried aboard merchant vessels returning from Asia. During the Little Ice Age, what came to be called the Black Death found the ideal breeding environment. The bubonic plague was made much worse during the Little Ice Age because people were already weakened by lack of food. Second, when it's cold and wet and damp outside, you don't go outside. So they huddled in small houses. And the rats came in too. The rats also were looking for warmth, and they came in bringing the fleas that uh, gave people the bubonic plague. Europe's infected masses began dying by the millions. The stench of decaying bodies filled the air. Church bells tolled day and night. Penitents who believed the plague was God's wrath roamed from city to city, flailing each other with whips. The mournful processions only spread the Black Death further. By the end of the epidemic in 1351, 25 million people had perished, a third of Europe's population. Those who survived continued to suffer through persistent famines and disease, many of which were triggered by the Little Ice Age. At flashpoints across Europe, the desperate reached breaking point, concluding the erratic climate was the evil handiwork of their neighbours, whom they accused of witchcraft. The statistics are scary. In 1563, the city of Weisenberg burnt 63 women to death as witches. In the canton of Bern, over a thousand people were killed as witches. You're talking considerable hysteria here. The church fed the frenzy. In 1484, Pope Innocent VIII issued a decree blaming Europe's cold, destructive climate on witches. Between the 14th and 17th centuries, foul weather and witch hunts went hand in hand. According to some historians, 50,000 men and women charged with brewing up diabolical storms were burnt at the stake. The Little Ice Age had ignited death and turmoil all across Europe. Another group of victims would be a remote colony of intrepid explorers at the edge of the known world. As the Little Ice Age mounted its assault on Europe in the 14th century, it also set its sights on an isolated colony at the edge of the Arctic frontier. The era's most vulnerable targets were a people who prided themselves on their strength and swagger. Since the 10th century, 4,000 Viking colonists had carved out a prosperous life for themselves on the rugged shores of Greenland.
Although few in number, history would cast them in the Little Ice Age's most epic drama, in the fight for survival. The colonists were the vanguard of the most feared and dominant culture of their time. The marauding Vikings had terrorized half of Europe and sailed the vast expanse of the Atlantic to the shores of North America. Their outposts in Greenland were an experiment propelling Europe towards colonization of the New World, 500 years before Columbus. But the Little Ice Age would bring their experiment to a chilling end. The Vikings settled in Greenland during the height of the medieval warm period, around the year 1000, when the higher temperatures made it inviting and habitable. It is sometimes thought that earliest Viking explorers to reach Greenland deliberately misnamed um, uh, the country because they wanted to uh, try to entice other settlers to come out. But in fact, when they first arrived there, uh, they were struck by the lushness of the vegetation that they encountered in some of the fjords that they sailed into. So the name Greenland actually may have been an accurate description because there may have actually been vegetation and greenery there at the time and even trees. When the Vikings came to this area they must have been thrilled because they found large areas with grass that their animals could feed on. And they could even go high up in the mountains to grass because here you have good grass on a higher altitude. So this must really have been a paradise. The Greenland Vikings depended not only on their abundant livestock to survive, but also on teeming schools of cod in the clement waters offshore. They also depended on imported goods from the distant shores of Europe. In return, they exported everything from polar bear skins to walrus tusks. The Vikings, who had begun to abandon their pagan ways and adopt Christianity, had faith that their future here was as limitless as the horizon. But with the arrival of the Little Ice Age, the mighty Vikings were forced to confront a faceless and formidable enemy, against which they had no defense. The windows here were so uh, cold, so severe, that the, the cattle and the sheep had to stay indoor in the stables for certainly more than six months and never come out all through the winter. And when winter was over, sometimes the cows were so weak from spending the winter that way that the farmers would have to go in and pick them up like little babies, pick them up and carry them out in their arms and put them on the fields of this, this spring and early summer to regain their strength. As the Little Ice Age persisted, the Vikings' livestock perished in increasing numbers. Faced with starvation, the colonists turned to Greenland's marine life. They know from measuring the isotopic composition of carbon in the bones from burials, that originally the Vikings were nourished by 80% stuff from the land, so they ate a hell of a lot of lamb, and 20% from the sea. Then as time went on, gradually that ratio changed, and toward the end, they were down to 20% coming from the land and 80% from the sea. The Vikings' plight worsened as the waters they now relied on for their only source of food became choked by ice. Greenland schools of temperature-sensitive cod fled the freezing coast to warmer southern waters. The Vikings began to starve. The gauntlet of sea ice finally cut them off from their Christian brethren in Europe whose supplies they relied upon to survive. Long periods of time passed without any ship connection, sometimes generations. It seems as if the weather itself was conspiring to crush them. 
one other determining factor was the Vikings themselves. Lessons in surviving the Little Ice Age had been within their grasp, but for more than a century, they'd chosen to ignore them. From the beginning, they had shared Greenland with the native Inuit people, who over the centuries had adapted themselves ideally to the freezing environment. Unlike the Vikings, the Inuit were able to fish during the coldest months of winter. The secret of their success? Ivory harpoons, state-of-the-art compared to the Vikings' crude spears. They were well aware of Inuit culture and well aware that the uh, Inuit survived winters. They may not have done it very comfortably, but they survived it, and they were well aware of their fishing techniques, but apparently they didn't adopt them. Why? Because probably they thought the Inuit were inferior. The Norse called the Inuit peoples Kralinger, and that's not a very kind word. In fact, it means ugly little people. If they had chosen the way of encounter with this other race, and eventually mixing genes with them, mixing culture, then they would have been able to adapt to this country. But they refused, and that was a mistake that finally killed them off. The Vikings' last stand in Greenland took place here, at the ruins of this church on the southern coast. Valso Church is important because this is the site of the last recorded historical event in all of North Greenland. The wedding took place here in 1408, and it must have been a large wedding because the source says it was attended by visitors, even as far as way as Iceland. What the source doesn't tell us is that it also took place in a society in disintegration due to the cold weather, but in fact, 50 years later. The Norse had all died out. The Little Ice Age had humbled the fearsome breed, renowned for their toughness and invincible spirit. The Vikings had no idea what forces of nature were responsible for the freezing climate that defeated them. 700 years after the onset of the Little Ice Age began, climatologists are still debating what natural processes triggered it. What caused the abrupt climate shift that doomed the Vikings? And devastated millions more in the medieval world? There is no clear consensus and no lack of theories. I believe the basic cause of the Little Ice Age was that we were getting less radiation from the sun at that time. The problem is that the reduction in radiation we got from the sun was very small, and we need um, to understand how such a small change in the amount of radiation we're getting from the sun can cause such obvious climate changes. During the Little Ice Age, the output of the sun was lower by about maybe a half a percent very small amount. If the one lesson that we can learn from the Little Ice Age, in my opinion, is that the Earth is extremely sensitive to very small nudges. Some scientists believe the sun is only part of the answer. Another piece of the puzzle may be much closer to home. In the ice packs of Greenland and Antarctica, scientists have discovered intriguing evidence from cause. Preserved in the ice is a record of climate dating back 115,000 years. Sulfur deposits in the ice cores indicate that during the Little Ice Age, there was an average of five major volcanic eruptions every century. Each of the eruptions had the explosive power of Krakatoa in 1883. Today, such powerful eruptions occur only rarely. A volcanic eruption puts out particles and puts out gases into the atmosphere. The main gases they put out are water vapor and carbon dioxide, which mix with the atmosphere. But it's the sulfur gases that cause climate to change. 
If the eruption is strong enough, it will have a plume that goes all the way up into the stratosphere. And these react with water vapor to form a cloud of sulfuric acid droplets, a thin, hazy cloud that's in the stratosphere. It can stay there for several years. And this cloud reflects sunlight back to space and cools the Earth's surface. Less sunlight gets to the surface. Some scientists believe the cause of the Little Ice Age had less to do with hot gas high in the Earth's atmosphere and more with cold water deep in its oceans. Their theory focuses on a phenomenon called the thermohaline circulation, or oceanic conveyor belt. The conveyor is a powerful flow of warm water that transports heat to northern latitudes. The Gulf Stream is just part of this massive global loop. In essence, the way that it works is that surface waters of the ocean get warm in the tropics because there's a lot of sunlight there. Those waters flow, they're conveyed north, about to the latitude of, let's say, Iceland. That's where they're losing a lot of heat to the atmosphere, so heat's being sucked out of the water. The conveyor's momentum continues as the cooling water grows dense and sinks. It then flows south to maintain balance with the warm water flowing north at the surface. Some scientists believe the Little Ice Age occurred when natural forces disrupted the enormous flow. That the catalyst was a flood of fresh water from Arctic ice which melted during the medieval warm period. The reason why people believe that the addition of fresh water can kill the conveyor is because you're basically messing with the salinity part of that equation. By adding lots of fresh water, you're making the surface waters less dense. And so, no matter how cold you get them, they can't sink. And if they can't sink, it stops the conveyor. If the conveyor stops, the effect on the Earth's climate, especially in Europe, could be catastrophic. Heat would no longer be transported to the atmosphere above the North Atlantic, and the prevailing eastward winds over the ocean would blow cold instead of warm air over the continent. Little Ice Age temperatures would abruptly engulf Europe. While scientists remain uncertain which natural forces triggered the Little Ice Age, they believe they know what caused the coldest seven decades within the Little Ice Age's 500-year span. Between 1645 and 1715, winter temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere dipped by an additional three degrees Fahrenheit. Climatologists traced the cause to the sun, which they believe was weakened by a phenomenon known today as the Maunder Minimum. The minimum there refers to a minimum in the number of sunspots on the face of the sun. And when there are less sunspots on the face of the sun, the sun is sending out less radiation and the Earth is getting less radiation. So if we're getting less radiation, that can cause a global cooling. The 70-year surge of cold triggered by the Maunder Minimum was the same era that witnessed the rapid advance of the Alpine glaciers and the desperate efforts of the people of Natase to repel them. If you are an alpine peasant and you are confronted with a glacier, it's rather like standing in front of ten bulldozers advancing on you in a line destined to knock down your house. Nothing you do short of intercession with the Almighty could stop it. According to French archives, several of the encroaching glaciers actually retreated after the clergy's ceremonial exorcisms. But many of the ice sheets eventually resumed their advance and continued to swallow up the villagers' homes and farmlands. In the 1600s, Europeans had no way of knowing that the Little Ice Age would persist for two more centuries. Chilling new disasters awaited civilization.
drip by drip. The 1600s saw the Little Ice Age continue its unrelenting assault on the people of Europe. Decade after decade, the cold destroyed many of the vulnerable cereal crops they relied on to survive. The lethal cycle of famine persisted. But by this time, farmers in England and the Netherlands were fighting back. With great ingenuity, they developed small holding agriculture. Agriculture where they planted such crops as turnips and clover, which they would sell to people who raised cattle. And the result was the first relatively modern farming economy and a farming economy that was based not on cereals but on crops that were much more resistant to cold, excessive damp or dryness. The production of cereals, which continued to be an important part of agriculture, could now be uh, practiced as part of a much larger and, and much better integrated farming strategy that also included livestock. The production of more livestock meant that there was greater manure resources available so that the productivity of the field could be sustained and improved indeed. So there's a kind of positive feedback that emerges between pastoral agriculture and more traditional forms of cereal agriculture. Farmers in much of Europe adopted the new innovations, powering an agricultural revolution that protected millions from the dangers of crop failure and famine. But Europe also had another weapon against the Little Ice Age, though few realized it at the time. A century earlier, Spanish explorers had brought back an unsightly root crop from the Peruvian Andes, the potato. The durable tuber could survive the cool temperatures and frequent storms that continue to devastate the peasants' cereal crops. But for generations, its potential had gone untapped. Strangely enough, Europeans refuse to eat the potato for many reasons. One, because of course they are wedded to a culture of cereal. That is to say, they really are tied to bread. And the potato is a plant that grows on the ground. The leaves are poisonous. It's covered with dirt. All those things make the potato very difficult to accept. From kings to commoners, the potato was known as the devil's plant. Many heeded the clergy's warning that to eat one was a sin. Millions went hungry rather than alter their diets. Nothing short of a war could dent their cultural resistance. During the Thirty Years' War, which was a terrible war that raged across Central Europe in the 1600s, armies swept across Central Europe, burning villages, taking women, doing all the terrible things that happened in war, including destroying the crops. And so any standing crop, like say, like barley or rye, they would burn or they would trash it with their cavalry. But potatoes are underground. You can't burn potatoes. And the German peasants latched onto this and switched crops massively. They realized the enormous advantages of them, and potatoes became a very, very popular crop in Northern Europe and literally saved the lives of thousands of people. Potatoes rescued many areas of Europe from the vicious cycle of crop failures. In the 17th century, famine diminished, and populations at long last began to rise. One nation, however, France, failed to adapt. People wanted to introduce the potato to French agriculture and the peasants wouldn't have anything to do with it. The king was trying to promote the potato and so he put the word out that he ate potatoes for supper, trying to popularize this new crop which he knew could make things better and the peasants just weren't having any of it. French peasants clung to tradition, not only rejecting the potato, but also the agricultural innovations pioneered earlier by the English and the Dutch. Decade after decade, they lived on the brink of starvation. 
By 1789, they were a ticking time bomb in a society already fractured by political upheaval. That winter, frost and bitterly cold temperatures devastated the nation's cereal crops, nudging them closer to revolution. The weather was colder than it had ever been. Two bad harvests and the cold had combined to put them into a situation where they knew they were not going to be able to make it through the next year. And they had to turn to the government, which at that time was having its own problems and was not able to do much for them. So it was a major factor in the French Revolution. In July 1789, rioting peasants stormed the countryside and cities with pitchforks and muskets, terrorizing the aristocracy. The chaos magnified the political unrest already consuming the nation. Within three weeks, the French National Assembly adopted its Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen that set France on the road to democracy. After the Little Ice Age had played its role in France's historic upheaval, its impact was next felt with devastating force in Ireland. The year was 1845. Two centuries had passed since the capricious climate had forced the Irish peasants to adopt the potato as a remedy to starvation. For most of that time, they had grown several different varieties of potato. But now they grew just one type, the lumper, the most user-friendly potato of them all. And this potato was very easy to cultivate and propagate. And it became the staple of the Irish peasant. But it's a low-quality potato, very watery, and very susceptible to disease. Ireland's potato-fed masses had tripled over the past 200 years. Six million people now depended on the lumper as their only source of food. But when a mysterious blight suddenly attacked the Irish potato crop, a nation's lifeblood dissolved into an inedible mass of black goo. The Irish potato famine lasted for five years. Wood engravings drawn by the artists of the London Illustrated News chronicled the anguish. Starving children gnawed on weeds. Weakened by malnutrition, thousands died of cholera and typhus. Emaciated mothers cradled dead babies as they begged for money to purchase coffins. The suffering was totally harrowing. There were stories of corpses in the street lying unburied and of rats devouring them in villages and of people going round and finding families living in their homes, lying in bed, too weak to move because they were dying of hunger or of dysentery. By the time the Irish potato crop recovered in 1851, the devastation was incalculable. It's estimated, and the estimate is probably conservative, that one and a half million Irish peasants died during the Irish potato famine the Great Death. But not every consequence of the Little Ice Age was catastrophic. If a recent theory is true, it may have helped produce one of music's most exquisite instruments. For music lovers, the sound is unmistakable. Nothing is sweeter to the ear than a Stradivarius. This violin is one of 600 surviving instruments handmade three centuries ago by Italian craftsman Antonio Stradivari. World renowned for their exquisite tone. If a new theory is valid, the Stradivarius may be one of the few bright spots born of the Little Ice Age. It is the latest effort to solve an age-old mystery. How did Stradivari create virtual perfection? 
there have been many theories and hypotheses offered why his instruments had superior tonal qualities. One is that there was a secret varnish that he was using, but scientific analysis has not been able to show that there was anything unique about Stradivari's varnish. Another hypothesis was that he was using wood that uh, came from very old structures such as cathedrals or castles and that this wood may have been hundreds and hundreds of years old by the time that he harvested it from these structures. Because of tree ring dating, we actually know this not to be true, that he was actually using wood that, f that grew during the 17th and 18th centuries. Climatologist Lloyd Burkle co-authored the hypotheses that may solve the riddle. He began by wondering if the wood Stradivari used came from trees that grew during the Maunder Minimum, the coldest era of the Little Ice Age, when the sun was at its weakest. I was working on my computer one day and I wondered if Stradivarius and the Wander Minimum started at the same time. I looked up on the web and within a few minutes I had my answer. Stradivarius and the Wander Minimum began life about a year apart. Italy's consummate craftsman was born in 1644. The Maunder Minimum began in 1645. The zenith of Stradivari's production coincided with a brief and unusual climate that may have produced uniquely dense wood with ideal acoustic properties. This is a fire escape. Yeah, this is the innermost ring. To explore his theory, Burkle contacted tree ring expert Henry Grissino Mayer at the University of Tennessee. When Dr. Burkle first contacted me about this, I thought to myself, why hadn't someone thought of this before? It just rang true with me. It, was, it just made sense. Trees, like sediment cores and ice cores, preserve valuable climate data. During warmer years, trees grow fast, adding thick rings. During cool years, growth is slow and rings are thin. If Burkle's theory is true, the trees of Stradivari's time possessed much more than just information about the freezing weather. And so I obtained tree ring data from uh, the Alps in Europe and we analyzed the tree ring data and we did indeed find that the Little Ice Age and especially the Maunder Minimum period was characterized by extremely slow growth, in fact the slowest growth in the trees during the last 500 to 600 even 700 years or so. Trees that grow slower will have different wood density from trees that grow much faster and in many ways keep in mind that the resonance of the wood depends on the widths of the rings themselves. I mean the widths, the cells that form the individual rings act much like sound chambers as a matter of fact. So this would seem to support the hypothesis that the widths of the rings might have contributed to the superior sound quality of musical instruments made at the time. Burkle and Grissino Mayer believe that the Stradivarius may owe its magic not just to when the trees grew, but where they grew. The trees of the Italian Alps were rooted in poor soil at high altitude, conditions that promoted slow, dense growth, even under a normal sun. The wood in the trunks of the trees, from which Stradivari made his violins, may have possessed superior properties of resonance that the Maunder Minimum enhanced. Is the Little Ice Age responsible for Stradivari's violin's superior sound? Some experts say no. They say that some of the renowned violins have wide tree rings and that violins made with the same wood by other craftsmen of the same era were mediocre. Nonetheless, Burkle's and Grissino Mayer's intriguing theory has brought new attention to one of music's most enduring mysteries. Music lovers aren't the only ones who may owe a toast to the Little Ice Age. Beer and spirits account for 93% of all alcoholic beverages consumed in the United States. If not for the Little Ice Age, these party animals might all be drinking wine instead. The backdrop to America's choice of alcohol began in 14th century England and throughout Northern Europe, when the Little Ice Age assailed the vineyards that thrived during the medieval warm period. When the Little Ice Age came, the grapevines were killed by the cold. They couldn't make wine anymore. 
it was the northern Europeans who were deprived of grapes. The southern Europeans, although the little ice age did penetrate down there, for example, the canals of Venice froze solid, uh, still the production of wine was not seriously cut back in southern Europe, and it's a sharp division in cultures. Northern Europeans had no choice but to satisfy their craving for alcohol with beverages made from the depleted supplies of their cereal crops, namely beer and spirits. So here we are in the 1600s then, and it comes to be a time of emigration to North America. And who comes? Well, not the Southern Europeans. There's virtually no emigration from the Mediterranean basin. It all comes out of the North. England, the Dutch, the Swedes come, the Germans come, the Poles come, the Irish, the Scots, and these people have now been living without wine for about 200 years. And they bring with them a culture which is based on drinking beer and hard liquor. And so this whole tradition continued. As much as colonial Americans relished beer, many also enjoyed wine imported from Europe. But beer and spirits remained their true passion. America's founding fathers typified the nation's preferences. Thomas Jefferson brewed beer at his estate at Monticello. And George Washington was the largest distiller of rye whiskey in the nation. Today, Americans drink an average of 23 gallons of beer every year. And over a gallon of spirits compared to only two gallons of wine. 88% of all the wine is drunk by only 11% of the population. And most of those people live on the two coasts. And the rest of the country is primarily a beer and hard liquor drinking nation. The Little Ice Age may be history, but its effects are still being felt today. One dimension of history in which the Little Ice Age intervened most dramatically was war. Victory or defeat often depended on the freezing weather. In 2001, in Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, a construction crew made a grisly discovery. Bulldozers unearthed 3,000 skeletons from what appeared to be a mass grave. Forensic experts determined that the bodies were almost 200 years old. Soldiers of Napoleon Bonaparte, victims of one of history's most catastrophic military campaigns, and the severe climate of the Little Ice Age. Throughout the period, weather played a crucial role in war. Generals learned that the elements could be their most formidable enemy or ally. Napoleon's lesson began in the autumn of 1812, after he had invaded Russia with a force of 600,000 men. Although he'd captured Moscow, he'd failed to destroy the Russian army and force the Tsar to capitulate. Three quarters of Napoleon's men had already died of starvation in the Russian wilderness, barren long before the Little Ice Age. As Napoleon ordered his 130,000 surviving soldiers to retreat for home, the climate took a nightmarish turn for the worse. The weather just, it's almost like the bottom drops out. The temperature drops down into the 30s below zero. And according to a, a fellow named Colincourt, who was on Napoleon's staff, the snow or crystals would float in the air. 
because he said the moisture in the air was freezing, but because it was so cold, the density of the air changed, and so they didn't drop out of the sky. They just hovered in the air as he was marching through them. And he said it was like a dream world. It was just something he had never seen before in his life. Napoleon's starving, exhausted troops began dying by the thousands. Many yielded to a craving for sleep and froze to death. And many soldiers successfully fought off the bitter cold, only to die of starvation. There's a memoir by one soldier that talks about how he survived during this campaign. He said it was so cold that the horses were, although they were moving, their outer skin was already frozen. And soldiers could go by and just cut off a piece of meat from a horse that was pulling a wagon uh, from the flank. And because it was so cold, first of all, the horse was numb and wouldn't feel it. And then when he started to bleed, the blood would just freeze, so it capped off the wound and, and the horse would just keep going along. 40,000 half-dead soldiers, a fraction of the original invading force of 600,000, made it as far west as Vilnius. In the city, which had little food, thousands died of starvation. Thousands more died from typhus and gangrene in makeshift hospitals. The stronger soldiers drove out the weaker from overcrowded houses and left them to freeze to death on doorsteps. Figures vary, but perhaps only four to 5,000 of the 40,000 who trudged into Vilnius escaped the city alive. Napoleon was not the only invader who failed to take into account the unpredictable climate during the Little Ice Age. In 1588, the Spanish Armada attempted a daring invasion of England. Its 130 warships confronted 197 English ships in the English Channel. Although the Armada had more powerful cannons, the English had more maneuverable ships. After five days, the battle was a stalemate. Then the English launched six blazing fire ships into the heart of the Armada, scattering the fleet. The Armada was repelled and found the English blocking its path back to Spain. The only realistic option lay in their circling around the British Isles, heading back for Spain and regrouping for a second attempt in 1589. Given the Spanish losses to this point, that is uh, six or seven vessels at most out of 130, the options seemed entirely plausible. But the resulting journey proved to be an odyssey of tragic proportions. Two intense low pressure systems hit the Spanish Armada. And when you get an intense low pressure system in the English Channel, it can be very, very, very rough indeed. The winds apparently were of hurricane force. Some of the waves were 20 to 30 feet high, mountainous waves. To add to their misery, the temperature was dropping, dropping in early September below freezing. Some of these men actually froze to death uh, in early September, a uh, most unusual occurrence. The towering waves swept scores of Spaniards overboard into the icy North Sea. Vessel after vessel crashed onto the rocky coasts of Scotland and Ireland. Corpses were washed up on shore by the hundreds. Twenty-one thousand Spaniards perished. The storm destroyed 56 of the Armada's ships. And of those that limped home to Spain, most were in such battered condition that they were dismantled for their wood.
for England, the defeat of the Spanish Armada was a great triumph, and it has been ever since celebrated by the English. However, the Spanish losses were mostly due to the weather. The English realized this. On one of the medals that was minted in commemoration of the victory, uh, Elizabeth had inscribed the words, God breathed and the enemy was scattered. Two centuries later, the Little Ice Age would once again play a pivotal role in the outcome of an historic battle. In 1776, nearly six months after the American colonies declared their independence, their cause was on the brink of collapse. George Washington and his crumbling Continental Army had lost New York to the British and fled to Pennsylvania. It really looked like the revolution was coming unglued. And as a consequence, he knew if he didn't get some sort of dramatic victory by the end of the year, then there's a real good chance that, that uh, when the snow melted away in the spring, his army would have melted away also. On Christmas night, Washington ordered a surprise attack across the Delaware River against Britain's Hessian mercenaries at Trenton, New Jersey. But the Little Ice Age threatened to destroy any chance he had for victory. Throughout that period, unlike now, the Delaware was often clogged with ice. According to historians, the renowned painting by Emanuel Lutz is in many ways remarkably accurate. For once, the romantic image happens to be the truth. The Delaware River back then was choked with ice, just choked with ice. That almost never happens these days. It's hardly ever cold enough at that latitude that you're gonna get that much ice around Christmas in, in the Delaware River. The Lutz painting is in touch with reality in the sense that it represents the ice as a physical threat. Some of the uh, troops even reported that the boats they were in began to collect ice around their hulls. It's getting so cold that the ice is actually starting to stick to the boats. And as a consequence, this river is just on the brink of wrecking the whole enterprise. Nine grueling hours passed before the Americans completed the crossing. Washington feared the delay might ruin any chance of achieving the surprise vital to his strategy. Two soldiers froze to death on the march to Trenton. But the Christmas attack overwhelmed the unsuspecting Hessians and rescued the revolution. George Washington's troops won the Battle of Trenton because they won the war against the weather. The victory over weather provided Americans with a sense of hope, a sense of possibility, uh, a sense that through similar kinds of um, sacrifices that they could indeed win this war. In 1815, the Little Ice Age was in its fifth century. James Madison was America's president. Congress was preparing to admit Indiana as the 19th state of the Union. And Andrew Jackson led 4,000 men to victory against the British in the Battle of New Orleans the final engagement of the 1812 war. 1815 also witnessed one of Earth's most spectacular natural disasters. In an era of increased volcanic activity that some scientists believe caused the Little Ice Age, the single most powerful eruption was soon to come. It would turn an already erratic climate upside down and cause what came to be known as the year without a summer. It began on the 5th of April with a deep rumble on the island of Sumbawa in Indonesia. On Sumbawa's north shore towered Mount Tambora, a 13,000-foot volcano thought to be extinct. On the 11th of April, Tambora exploded. 
The top 4,200 feet of the mountain was blasted skywards, spewing 36 cubic miles of debris into the atmosphere. This is the cataclysmic eruption of 9,000-foot Mount St. Helens in 1980. Tambora threw out a hundred times as much ash. We are talking about something that makes Mount St. Helens in 1980 look like a firecracker. Within instants of this explosion, 70,000 people on the island and on the neighboring islands died. And then that number went up to 90,000 um, very soon after that. A huge amount of ash went into the atmosphere. And think of it as not just kind of going up, but going way up above the level of weather, 15 and a half miles into the atmosphere. It's not the explosive power of a volcano that influences how much climate change there is. It's the amount of sulfur that it puts in the stratosphere. Because this sulfur dioxide gas reacts with water vapor and forms tiny little sulfuric acid droplets that reflect sunlight back to space, cooling the Earth's surface. Months passed before Tambora affected Earth's climate. The first bizarre sign that something was really up with the atmosphere was in the snowfall that came in the winter of 1815 to 1816. Hungary, a snowy place, noticed their snow was brown. That's kind of strange. Apulia, in the south of Italy, which doesn't usually get snow, noticed their snow was red. The multicolored snow was the peculiar result of Tambora's ash mixing with water vapor high in the Earth's atmosphere. As the summer of 1816 approached, the full effect of Tambora's eruption descended on the unsuspecting people of Europe. There's descriptions of the sort of dusty fog hanging in day after day, cold and dreary rain. Just imagine kind of the worst blustery weather, except it's summer. That's what it was like in Northern Europe. In 1816, Europeans were still recovering from the Napoleonic Wars and were once again reliant on agricultural resources spread too thinly. The Arctic weather devastated the continent's crops. Multitudes began to starve. The people who survive are much, much weakened because of the lack of food and disease becomes widespread. There's a huge outbreak of typhus that hits Ireland and 100,000 people die of typhus that's directly related to the year without a summer. History of a quieter kind was being written at one of Europe's most remote resorts. The summer of 1816, Percy Bysshe Shelley, the romantic poet, and his wife, Mary Shelley, who's 19 years old, and their friend, Lord Byron, went to the shores of Lake Geneva to have their summer vacation. And normally they would go hiking and boating and having fun, but it was so cold and gloomy that summer that they couldn't go out and enjoy themselves. So they decided to have, they were writers, they decided to have a contest to see who could write the scariest ghost story to pass the time. And that summer, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. If you look at Frankenstein, at the beginning of the book, the monster is climbing over the ice in the Arctic. And at the end of the book, the monster is also climbing over the ice. It's a very cold imagery. And she even writes at the beginning of the book how this imagery, this thinking about how cold and icy it was, was influenced by the climate outside the door when she was writing the book. As Europe's bitter summer persisted, it continued to trigger famine and epidemics. The people could finally stand no more. In France, rioting mobs attacked grain carts on their way to market. In England, the starving carried banners reading, bread or blood, as they looted and vandalized town after town. In Switzerland, Desperate villagers seized Russian grain shipments at the border. The governments of Europe were not equipped to provide the food and relief that people demanded. Tens of thousands starved to death, just as many fled Europe, hoping to rebuild their lives in America. Across the Atlantic, however, the consequences of Tambora descended with equal ferocity in the United States. In June, 14 months after the eruption, the skies over New England turned icy cold. 
Temperatures plummeted below freezing, and five days of snow fell in the northeast. And people were just shocked. Normally in June, you never had snow. You had rainstorms, but not snow. And so people were shocked and wrote in their diaries about what strange weather they were having. Snow persisted sporadically throughout July and August. Ice formed on lakes in Vermont. Icicles a foot long clung to the eaves of houses, and hundreds of newly shorn sheep froze to death. Each wave of cold destroyed thousands of crops. 75% of America's corn was ruined. Across the Northeast, food shortages mounted and agricultural prices skyrocketed. Birds are falling dead out of the sky because it is that cold. This is devastating for farmers, something they cannot recover from and something that is completely unheard of. At that point, people began referring to this as 1800 and froze to death, or else the year without a summer. In Europe, the year without a summer forced governments to create new policies of emergency relief. In America, it helped push the nation west. Things were so bad in New England in the summer of 1816 that there was this spike in the number of people who just gave up. That was it, no more New England, and they moved west. And they have no idea that the cause of this is a volcano that goes off the year before, halfway around the world. Around 1850, four decades after the year without a summer, the Little Ice Age came to an abrupt end. The dramatic shift occurred over the course of perhaps only a decade. Scientists disagree about what natural force was responsible. In the same way that the Little Ice Age was probably fundamentally caused by a reduction in the amount of radiation that the Earth gets from the Sun, when it ended in the late 19th century, that occurred at a time when the, the Sun started putting out more energy. The end of the Little Ice Age was caused by fewer volcanic eruptions during that period, but also industrialization and anthropogenic pollution caused by greenhouse gases. The end of the Little Ice Age, I think, was caused by the same thing that brought the previous 10 cycles to an end, that it's a natural fluctuation, and I think it's the ocean. Some scientists believe that the oceanic conveyor, the powerful flow that transports heat to northern latitudes, oscillates in strength. That the most recent weak cycle of the conveyor caused the Little Ice Age. And that the most current, strong cycle, still continuing today, brought it to an end. With the forces underlying the Little Ice Age uncertain, questions remain. Will another ice age strike? When? And what devastating effects might it have on humanity? A recent report commissioned by the Pentagon may be an alarming blueprint of the future. One hundred and fifty years have passed since the end of the Little Ice Age. Climate and humanity alike have been transformed. A cool, agrarian world of one billion is now a warming, mechanized planet teeming with over six billion. Global temperatures are rising faster than at any time in the past thousand years. According to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Changes, the mercury could shoot up as high as another 10 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. Most climatologists agree that today's rapid warming has been triggered by man. Decades of burning coal, gas and oil have overloaded the atmosphere with carbon dioxide, which traps the sun's heat that would otherwise radiate into space, creating the so-called greenhouse effect. The consequences of continued global warming are still uncertain. Many believe higher temperatures will trigger more intense droughts. Hurricanes may multiply, 
because they draw their energy from warm ocean water. And floods may increase due to rising sea levels caused by melting polar ice. As devastating as these scenarios could be, some scientists believe global warming could trigger the most catastrophic result of all, an ice age. They theorize that the same process that may have caused the Little Ice Age is repeating itself. They believe the heat is melting Arctic ice and flooding the North Atlantic with fresh water. This threatens to shut down the oceanic conveyor that warms the Earth. We have a paradox in climate, and that is that warming can lead to cooling. If we continue warming the Earth in the business-as-usual mode, if we did freshen the surface of the North Atlantic enough, we might precipitate a climate change, something like what happened during the Little Ice Age. We can think of this freshening trend as a stroll towards a cliff in the fog. We don't know exactly where we're going. We don't know where the edge of the cliff is. And some of my colleagues think that we could go into an abrupt cooling state in a matter of decades. This recent theory represents a new twist to the possible consequences of global warming. But many scientists reject it. I disagree with the climate researchers who have said that global warming could trigger a new little ice age. I don't believe that the thermohaline circulation um, is going to slow down drastically um, in the next century. And I also believe that even if it does, um, its impact on the temperature around um, the North Atlantic in Western Europe, for example, is relatively modest. And the warming that is going to occur simply because of the rising amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere will overwhelm any cooling. So in net, it's going to warm in that region, not get colder. As the scientific community debates the issue, a troubling question looms. What consequences would an abrupt cooling have on 21st century civilization? If we look at all of that's happened in the last two centuries, all of the development both in this country and globally, it's all been within the context of people being used to what their natural climate is like. In other words, they have a certain range of expectations for summers and winters and what the average climate is. Um, someone once told me, you know, it's not the fall that kills you, it's the sudden change in direction. The process of being thrown in one extreme or another that's different from what you're used to, it's that change in adaptation that causes cultural chaos. If anything that the Little Ice Age will teach us is that dramatic changes in weather patterns will have incredible negative impacts on human populations. We could have conditions that will parallel the horrors that Europe faced in the Little Ice Age. If an ice age struck in the 21st century, would our technologically dependent society, burdened by thinly spread resources, be just as vulnerable as the world of our ancestors? In 2003, the Pentagon commissioned futurists Peter Schwartz and Doug Randall to forecast the possible consequences. Their report is not a prediction, but a worst-case scenario designed to help government leaders formulate strategies to cope with any future crisis. You'd have to evaluate the likelihood of this scenario at, say, something on the order of one or two in a hundred. You know, it's, it's that sort of probability. Uh, it's not 10 percent, it's not 20 percent, it's not 50 percent, and it's by no means inevitable. But it's a real probability. The Pentagon scenario for the future is based on an actual climate event from the past. 8,200 years ago, temperatures dropped 9 degrees Fahrenheit for about a century. The abrupt cooling was minor compared to the last major ice age 15,000 years ago, but more severe than the Little Ice Age. The Pentagon scenario begins by plunging the Earth into the same frosty environment. Within a decade, nations are rapidly drained of food, water and energy resources critical to national survival. 
In Europe, skirmishes erupt between neighboring states over access to shared rivers and oil reserves. The chill spawns a new world disorder. And one superpower mobilizes its resources, trying to stabilize it. The U.S.'s role as a global cop will get much bigger than even today. There's a potential for conflict, there's going to be a need for huge movements of food, and only the U.S. has the logistical capacity, the military capacity, to act as kind of the cops under those circumstances to help assure order and to manage those relief efforts in behalf of the global community. According to the Pentagon scenario, however, America faces its own crisis. As the cold, dry climate persists, famine intensifies in the nations neighboring its southern border. The starving and the displaced begin a massive migration towards the United States. One can imagine literally many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of refugees coming on our shores from particularly the Caribbean and Central America. But there's another weirder scenario, you know, where people in the Southwest find it better to head south, uh, where the conditions in the Southwestern United States are so bad and maybe they need to go into Mexico and Central America. You know, hard to predict. So uh, the, the, the question of the uh, transparency and polarity of our border is, will be an important question. One of the most volatile flashpoints in the Pentagon scenario is China. Here, the cold climate triggers famines that kill millions and also drains the nation's energy supplies. A civil war erupts in the most populous nation on Earth. At the same time, China's army threatens to invade Russia to seize its rich reserves of natural gas. And its navy confronts the United States in the Persian Gulf over access to Saudi Arabian oil. Many of the same effects that I'm describing for China will also be true for India. And now you take into account Pakistan, where it could also be very true, and suddenly you have a, a devil's brew of three nuclear-armed countries, all potentially struggling over shared water supplies, access to water, food, and so on, and you have all of the makings for serious conflict. It's not at all implausible that these are the conditions under which nuclear weapons might be used. Could a 21st century ice age actually ignite this apocalyptic chain of events? Critics of the Pentagon's report brand it alarmist fantasy. Others contend it raises issues too profound to ignore. If we're not prepared for this scenario, it increases the likelihood of conflict. That's what I'm most worried about. I think a great deal more research needs to be done. We need to really understand the dynamics of abrupt climate change. We need much better data, much better models, much more support for the research. And then a really aggressive debate within the scientific and policy communities about how urgent the priority of this is. Researchers are in a race to find the elusive answers before our volatile climate reaches a critical threshold. As they look to the future, the only certainty is that nothing is certain. We don't know whether we're going into a hyper-warming situation for the North Atlantic or a regional cooling. There is that much uncertainty in the models. The uncertainty in this climate issue is tremendous and it behooves us to be a little more cautious in how we treat the climate system of our planet. When we consider what's happening in the future as a result of increases in greenhouse gas emissions, we're really not certain of what's going to happen. It's almost as if you're just tapping on a bell with a very small hammer, and that would be the Little Ice Age. And here we are now with a big sledgehammer in our hand, and we're wondering what's the sound going to be. Climate has been likened to this angry beast, and we're poking it with a stick. And frankly, I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows, when we are likely to cross some threshold. And I wonder how long we are willing to play this game with the climate system. How much risk are we willing to take? Not so long ago, the Little Ice Age pushed civilization over a threshold with devastating consequences. 
If the past is a prologue, a storm awaits on the horizon. Find out more about how you can get involved in the Earth Day celebrations online at earthdaycounts.co.uk where you'll have a chance to win a designer energy monitor as well as getting facts, figures and great ways to save money. And there's more to come here on Sky Anytime. Just check out the menu. This would allow...